We are in a series dealing with the um, concepts of the doubters. These are the arguments that um, we hear against Christianity and one of the reasons why they excuse themselves from being believers. Wanting to deal uh, correctly with this and not uh, dodge the issue, we want to look at God and the skeptics. This is part one. We'll be getting into seven reasons why we should believe in Christianity, the positive side of this. But for this, we're looking at seven skeptical doubts. This is doubt number four, and it's expressed as the church is responsible for injustices. Therefore, I don't want to have any part in it. I don't want to be involved in it. Now, I have to admit, we have to, being people of reading history, we will not argue against the fact that religion has supported and even instigated war, injustice, violence throughout the years. Um, the, uh, the Crusades were, was a political mess, uh, trying to gain back property that the church felt that they lost and all these things. Um, just insane concepts. Have you heard of the Children's Crusade? Uh, just horrible concepts. But it's also easy to point to the church throughout history as sending people to war and chasing heretics to death and hiding or protecting wickedness like child molestation. They just found up, uh, thousands of people in Illinois, uh, uh, priests that were molesting children. <clears throat> it goes on today. However, we need to clarify that not everything that glitters is gold, not everything that's called Christian is actually Christian. There are people who want to call themselves that, but uh, time and effort and so on has gone into it where they've just lost what Christianity is all about. And it's not Christian. There are false prophets, false teachers. Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. They come in among us sheep, but, you know, you saw it in the cartoons, right? They have the sheepskin over their head and wolves sneaking in. And uh, what do they want? They want to they shear the sheep. They want to eat the sheep, you know. These are teachers that can be exposed by their doctrine, what they teach, and by their actions, how they live. Now this said, there are three charges that are made, unfairly I think, against Christianity that reveal a false concept of what Christianity is. And this might help you because you, like I, have been on the receiving end of a lot of this uh, by uh, implication, if not direct comment and people thinking this and we may have come to where we begin to think this way about ourselves the first one is this Christians are no better and sometimes worse than non-Christians and I would say I would guess so here's the thing uh, certainly if you have a church where wicked men rule it will be found guilty of injustice. This is the bureaucracy churches that uh, uh, have land that they want to protect. They have uh, uh, protect. They want trade to be protected. All of this business, just business stuff, having nothing to do with the Bible. But this criticism is based upon a false belief. This false belief. If Christianity is true, then Christians would be better people than non-Christians. This is defining Christianity as whether you're good or not. So I have some blanks here for you to fill out if you want to follow along, be able to follow along by uh, actually participating. This first blank is number one. My answer is obedience to God's rules of life will bring about a better life whether or not a person is a Christian. 
There are people who say to their pastor, uh, I have an unbelieving neighbor, and uh, he and his wife are getting along fine, and I have trouble with my partner. See? And we're Christians. Well, it's not whether you're a Christian or not, it's whether you're actually obeying God's laws. God gave you the way to do it, you see. Some non-Christians were raised to have good morals. I see this, uh, people raised, especially on the East Coast. They grew up with uh, standards, you know. And maybe they never go to church at all, but, uh, but they, have, they were raised with good morals. They will reap the benefit of a better life, even though they will go to hell after death. Some who became Christians struggle with moral problems. They have difficulties in this life, even though they will go to heaven after death. So, this is fact number one, that how your life goes depends on whether you're obeying God's rules, whether you actually believe they're God's rules or not. One man said, my mother taught me better than that. And... Um, what he meant by that is that I learned my good morality from my parents. I don't need a church for that. See? The second blank is this. Christianity teaches that men are sinful and are saved only by God's grace. Let's be clear what a Christian is and what it is not. Christians, if they continue to grow in faith and grace will become the best of men. But sadly, this does not always happen. It's not always the case. So, we may find the best of men. But we might find people that are still struggling. The third is this, third blank. Churches are often a place where people come to be healed, and to be confirmed in God's truth. You say, well, what, is, what does this mean? It means that you may go to a church and find at any one time there may be many gathered here, as they are in a hospital, who are in a condition of weakness and need not riding the top of victory. The word hypocrite is used so uh, often and incorrectly. Um, uh, the Christian is called a hypocrite if he doesn't keep up standards. That's not hypocrisy. That's, that's human failure. Now, you are a hypocrite if you say, I have conquered this, but in actuality you're doing it. That's a hypocrite. That's a play actor. That's the person who's pretending. But the person who says, I ought to do this, I haven't got there yet, that's not hypocrisy. Saying I'm a Christian does not say, I am perfect. Just not what it says. So, point A was, Christians are no better and sometimes worse than non-Christians. All right, that's true. But it actually doesn't affect what Christianity really is. Just the state of affairs of a Christian at the time. The second uh, charge is that religion breeds violence. For instance, Christopher Hitchens in his book, God is Not Great, how religious poisons our, religion poisons everything. He gives his personal accounts of religion-fueled violence in Belfast, Beirut, Belgrade, Bethlehem, Baghdad, and that's just the bees. Now, clearly, religion may be blamed. It often makes one side of the violence feel that it's fighting for God's side, while the other is on, in league with the devil. We ought to just eliminate them. 
So to, to answer this logically, let's just say first of all, and my first blank here is um, number uh, one under religion breeds violence. Religion is not alone in this condemnation. There's violence caused by a lot of places. And to single out religion and say it's religion's fault is, is pretty nearsighted, small-minded. Small Anti-religious governments in France, Germany, Russia, China have fueled more violence than any other groups in all of history. Just check the facts. So, you know, the same argument made about religion could be made for government. The second answer to this is that this charge is based on the false belief that if a church is called Christian, it is really Christian. I was reading a book called World Religions. And um, it was summarizing Christianity. And it said, let's analyze the mass, for that is the heart of Christianity. And I understood that this person didn't know what Christianity was, though he wrote a book on it. He had evidently visited Roman Catholicism and seen what a mass did. I think we're familiar with the unrest in Ireland, the Protestants and, and uh, Catholics there. But that is more historic than based on religious fervor. I became connected with that, uh, a man that um, spoke often at Bob Jones University, and I got to speak to personally from time to time, a true Christian, Dr. Ian Paisley. He was a free Presbyterian pastor. He was a force for peace respected by both sides of the conflict. They would sometimes call for him to step up when they were threatening to kill one another. And he did. Now, he's a big man. He was a giant of a man. We would watch him. He'd hold his big Bible tucked up under his arm and walk across big strides. And you, you knew you just didn't want to get in his path, you know. You'd have to jump out of the way. He was a big, big guy with the Lord now. But whenever a Bible-believing Christian faces violence, they are the calming influence. They seek to be the peacemakers. Christ said, blessed are the peacemakers. Now, religions are invented by the wicked heart of man. They're just another group seeking dominance over somebody, seeking political favor, seeking rule over people. You bring, bring them money or you go to hell and, and now I'm rich, you know. But God-given Christianity seeks to win others, not hurt others. We're not trying to kill heretics. We're trying to win them to the Lord. It's just a, a completely opposite point of view. And our goal is not dominance. It's living in simple peace. Listen to the Apostle Paul telling them at a time when Rome was an evil government, 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, he says, I exhort therefore that first of all, and he uses several words about different kinds of prayer, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And he gives examples for kings and for all that are in authority. And what should we be praying for? That the Baptist church becomes the dominant <laughs> country, mandatory yeah, no. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Let's pray they leave us alone. Let's pray that we can do what God called us to do 
without interference. That's, that's the Christian attitude. Now I have a third blank. And that is that history has shown the difference between a so-called Christian bureaucracy and a true Christian church. If you study the history of the church before and after the Reformation, not only Romanism, as across the street, but also the Protestant churches, the protesting churches, the Reformation people, they killed Baptists as heretics before and after the Reformation. We are not part of the Reformed faith. We, in the sense of those who have held to um, what Baptists believe, separation of the church and state. We're not trying to run the state. We're asking them to leave us alone. Christ said, given to Caesar that which is Caesar, given to God that which is God. There was a separation there. The Baptists held that there was going to be a 1,000 year reign of Christ. And the reformers said, this is heresy. They called us Kiliosts from the Greek word for a thousand years. And they said, you're just messing up what the Bible teaches. And they, they would say, you know, there were, there were Baptists that were put to death because they wouldn't wear the robes of the clergy. Why? Because they said, there's no such thing in the Bible. People preaching to people. Sinners preaching to sinners. We're not, we're not something special. We're not a separate group. Uh, to disagree with us is to be killed. Sounds like modern America. All right. My third point here is the third uh, attack is that Christianity breeds fanaticism. Oh. We like to be fans, we just don't want to be fanatics, right? Let's paint our faces blue and white, and go to the ball game, we'll be a fan. You know that's short for fanatic, right? <laughs> but we don't want fanatics. No, none of that fanatics for me. The average person is turned off by the fanatic who loudly condemns various groups from homosexuals to public school system. Yeah, you fanatics. The fanatic appears intolerant and self-righteous. We, holy people, don't like you folks. You kind of folks, you see. But the charge is based on this false belief. That Christians range from being a nominal Christian, one who calls himself a Christian, to being a fanatical one. The best Christian would be one who stays in the middle where he really believes, but he's not too devoted. That would be fanatical. So let me make, how many things do I have? Three? Three things. Three things clear. Number one, blank number one on this third one, Christianity and listen to this carefully, is not a form of moral improvement. Now, following Christianity correctly will improve your morality, but that's not what it is. It's a plan of salvation that gives you power to conquer immorality. This is a different thing. Christianity is not a form of moral improvement. Most religions are. This is what they're all about. Follow me and you'll have a better life with this type of thing. Moral improvement. Let's look at the truth. The whole concept of salvation by works 
raises its head in this concept. That you only have that salvation if you're a really a good person. In reality, the best Christian is not necessarily the most intense moralist. The person who's campaigning for proper morals, campaigning against wrong morals. Uh, that's not what Christianity is. That's not the essential message of Christianity. It's a wonderful byproduct that people have better lives, but that's not what the best Christian is. This is not Christianity. The second point, and fill in the second blank, Christianity is receiving salvation from our old sinful condition by the free gift of God. See, now we're talking about what Christianity really is. This isn't how to get you to act better. This is providing a salvation from flaming hell by the free gift of God. Now, you see what this assumes? You are in a sinful condition. You are in a savagely horrible condition until you get saved. So this is essentially humbling. This is not proud people bragging over others. <laughs> if I'm a Christian, it means I have recognized my terrible, sinful condition. I have admitted it before God and others. And I'm asking him to help me out of it. So, a fanatic is overbearing, self-righteous, opinionated, insensitive, and harsh. Now, let's call it as it is. This is not because he's too Christian, but because he's not Christian enough. He hasn't got what Christianity is trying to get into him. Let's talk about being a fanatic Christian. If a person truly follows Christ, he would be fanatically humble, fanatically sensitive, fanatically forgiving, fanatically understanding. <laughs> and I don't think people would complain about that. And then, against Christianity breeds fanaticism, let me just say that biblical Christianity has always fought for social justice. Let me just give you an example of Christ explaining things in Luke eleven thirty nine to 46. This isn't a, a passage to we want to preach on. It's just showing you Christ's attitude... And we are Christian as we follow Christ. The Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees, religious leaders of the Jews of his day, make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. He says this white cup that you've polished so well on the outside is filthy on the inside. Well, what good is that cup except for show? Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without, made the outside, make that which is within also? Do you think God is only about the outside? No, he made the inside too. But rather, give alms of such things as you have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs. You catch this picture? They're saying we are 
dedicated to God. We give a tenth. They get their ruler and they go out to the garden. They measure out ten inches. Okay, clip. This goes to God. See? Mint, rue, all manner of herbs. I mean, they are meticulous. Meticulous? Yep. They're careful <laughs> about these things. Pass over judgment, justice, and the love of God. O oops, I missed those two. Being just, loving God? No, no, no. I'm cutting herbs here for God. This is me. This is my righteousness. Now he says, these things you ought to have done. You ought to give to God the tithe. That was the rule for the Jews. And not to leave the other undone. You shouldn't have just left the other. Woe unto you, Pharisees. For you love the uppermost seats in the synagogue. That's the high guy's place, see? Yes, you see where I'm sitting. And greetings in the markets. Oh, holy man, hi, you know. Yes, yes, that's me. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You say you're one thing, but you're doing the opposite. For you are as graves which appear not. And men that walk over them are not aware of them. Then answered one of the lawyers and said, Master, thus saying, thou reproachest us also. And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for you laid men with burdens grievous to be borne, and you yourselves touched not the burdens with one of your fingers. It never occurs to you to say, let me help you. I'm just going to put more burdens on you. Lawyers meant people that studied the law. Here is Christ's attitude toward these people who were being so meticulous, being fanatically careful. Luke 20, 47. Which devour widows' houses. They foreclose. Hey, business is business. And for a show, make long prayers. The same shall receive greater damnation. Pretending to be God's people, but acting like self-rule devil's people. In fact, let me turn this around a bit, the very critics of Christianity borrow their concepts of criticism from biblical Christianity. They're not, they're not arguing from their own secular lifestyle. Let me speak about social progress. Anti-slavery doctrines appeared in Christian theology soon after the decline of Rome. Early on, Christian activists like William Wilberforce of England and John Woolman of America, they devoted their lives to ending slavery. Why? It was not a political move. It was a Christian move. Let me take you more recently. The civil rights issue in the United States was not won by the white northern liberals they believed in the goodness of human nature. They tried to make changes by education and example. Man's okay. Maybe a little sick, just needs a little help. They hoped this would enlighten men. But nothing changed. Real change when Dr. Martin Luther King, a Christian, went to seminary with uh, one of the men who was on the board of, of Heritage Baptist College, he appealed to God's moral law and he appealed to the scriptures in his speeches. He called on white Christians to be more true to their stated beliefs. He did not call the southern churches to become more secular. He was preaching Bible stuff. 
So when people commit injustice in the name of Christ, they are not being true to the spirit of Christ. What is the ultimate example? Christ himself. Jesus, who offered himself a victim to injustice, called on God to forgive his tormentors. So, Christians who conform to the image of Christ will offer their lives to liberate others. Christianity is not guilty of what they say we are. Religion, yes. You can make a religion a spur of the moment. Just come up with something. You know. I believe in checkered cloth, you know. Long live checkered cloth. But Christianity is specifically not given to injustice. Let's pray. Father, the world has mistaken who we are and then blamed us for things that we've never done. While religion is evil in many cases, for it's ruled by men, invented by men, it is the uh, imagination of man, perhaps using the Bible, but falsely so, I ask that you might guide and direct us to recognize that it's not truly Christian unless it's coming from the Bible. It's not truly Christian unless it's following the teachings and the practices of Christ. I ask that you might help us then to recognize that these broad statements would appear to have truth to them, but in fact, they're not speaking of Christianity. I pray, Father, that you might help us then to recognize what Christianity is, to stand by it, and to be a force for good, especially when we see our country turning to wrong and trying to justify it, turning to that which enslaves people in drugs, in sexual immorality, in uh, just the malicious use of the medical community to, to change people for the sake of some political movement. I ask, Father, that you might help us then to regret how we have perhaps contributed to a false understanding if we have mistaken what our Christianity is and thought that we could condemn others to make ourselves feel better, that we could um, persecute others to make ourselves feel dominant, I ask, Father, you might help us to repent of all that and to recognize we are sinners saved by grace and that if that's true, then we ought to live according to the plan that you've given us. With heads bowed, eyes closed. It may be you're saying, Pastor, I haven't really followed through on this thought about what Christianity really is. It's not just trying to be good. It's not just appearing to be good. It's actually living according to the strength of the Word of God and turning our lives over to Jesus Christ doing what's right because it pleases the one who gave his life for us. If God needs to turn your heart around in this thing, I wonder if you just slip your hand up and say, pray for me, Pastor. Pray for me so I understand the truth. Pray for me that I understand what's right. To live according to that truth. Pray for me. Our Father, then we thank you that we have the truth, that you've given it to us, and it is unchanging. It has been the truth. It was given as the truth. It will always be the truth. 
the heavens may roll up like a scroll, but the truth will remain the same. I pray for each one here we might understand truly what Christianity is and recognize that we have not been the force of injustice. Baptists uh, holding to what we believe have never uh, burnt people at the stake. We've never condemned people to death. It's not our, our role. I pray that you might help us then to be the Christians you intended us to be. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.